Hey, I'm Shannon Rice, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN. And this week, Lectures in History shares a class on Operation Rolling Thunder from the Vietnam War. Douglas Kennedy of the U.S. Air Force Academy teaches the goals of the air campaign, which took place from 1965 to 1968. He also describes the campaign's limitations to avoid antagonizing other communist powers, such as the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. The Johnson administration saw those countries as defenders of communism, who might intervene if the North Vietnamese faced defeat. Consequently, the administration tried to punish the North without provoking the two nations believed to be its protectors. More on Operation Rolling Thunder with Professor Kennedy right after this. Sir, passport's ready for instruction. Thanks, awesome. Take seats. Good to see you guys all here today. Appreciate you coming. Today, as you know, we did the reading out of the Thompson book, two big chapters uh, discussing Rolling Thunder. Obviously, the, uh, I had to limit how much you could read those two chapters, focusing on the latter part of Rolling Thunder. So uh, we'll establish some good context and, uh, and then discuss air power um, in, uh, in this operation. Uh, again, last time we talked about Vietnam. This is our second of four lessons talking about air power in Vietnam. Last time, reading out of Schleit's text, we discussed air power in the South, primarily his chapters discussing the advisory role. All right, so we're kind of doing a chron- chronological approach, and we've uh, reached, uh, we've looked at that period of time from uh, insurgency growing, North Vietnamese support of that insurgency in 59, and that advisory role from 61 to 64. Uh, so now we're focusing on uh, air power against North Vietnam. Just to give some context, a lot of historians, when they look at the Vietnam War, break it down into four phases. Again, that air power that we studied last lesson was in that advisory phase, 56 to 64, the rise of the advisors and watching them in the air power role, how they're applying uh, air power in the South. And now we're getting to the Americanizing of the war. So we're going to look at context of the, how the Gulf of Tonkin affects uh, the, uh, the understanding and the development and the planning for a strategic campaign, air campaign against the North, and how, this, uh, how we get into this air campaign in March of 65. Uh, remember, we're at a very specific time, very uh, chaotic time in the United States and in South Vietnam. So as we've finished up that advisory role, uh, we've had some significant events happening, two major ones, assassination of President Kennedy um, in the United States. So we're going to have a new president who's taking things over and seeing what's happening. Um, and three weeks before Kennedy is assassinated, uh, assassinated um, Ziem is uh, assassinated in South Vietnam. So there's a period of chaos, a period of uncertainty, and, how, and, and what a reevaluation. This is a perfect time for a reevaluation of uh, what the United States is doing um, in Vietnam. So there's him taking the oath above the, uh, on the plane, going back to D.C., um, And so now, think about what he's facing, December 63, going into 64, uh, trying to get his arms around everything that a president needs to get his or her arms around. And there is a discussion. There's like three three things that uh, the United States could do. They could continue on this path uh, of a divisory role and maybe increasing a divisory role. That's what we've seen happening. They could get even more involved with its military to include introduction of more air power assets. Or it could actually just disengage from South Vietnam. And there's rationale of why the, why the path is chosen that they choose. They kind of do the in-between um, an advisory role and an introduction of, uh, of more forces. So the idea is we're going to stay engaged in South Vietnam. And when Johnson's trying to make his decision, his Secretary of Defense McNamara sends them a memo. This is, I think, a significant uh, uh, point uh, in March of 64 to say this is why we need to uh, stay engaged. This is uh, what we should do and how we should do it. McNamara had gone with the chief of of the Joint Chief Staff, um, Maxwell Taylor, on an advisory mission to Vietnam in September 1963. Uh, Things weren't going well with the ZM regime. And Kennedy wanted to get a better uh, uh, grasp of the situation. Well, now McNamara is going to go back to that, that report and summarize it in a memo to the president and then offer, this is our way ahead. And he pulls language from that report uh, in this memo. And the president will uh, acknowledge it all and concur with it all. And he does it in a formal way 
through a National Security Action Memorandum 288. And from the language, um, from the language of the report text, it says, what's our objective? We seek an independent, non-communist South Vietnam. One where the South Vietnamese must be free and can get outside assistance as required. But that first sentence is so significant. Because also in the discussion of this report is the idea that, hey, the, back in September 63, when it's being written, uh, the ZM administration is, is problematic. It's corrupt. It's for focusing more on consolidating power and get rid of enemies than it is fighting the communists. And so uh, the other term that you see often with, when someone talks about the Vietnam War and our objective, they always throw in, we seek a stable meaning a stable and a productive government, right? A stable, independent, non-communist South Vietnam. And they bring with them what McNamara, what President Johnson, and Kennedy before is bringing with them is the idea that um, this is definitely within the Cold War. We'll see. It's a containment, and they buy into this idea of the domino theory. All right? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, up until that point with this document being uh, introduced, to the idea. Was this before then codified? Because I realize you, you put a lot of emphasis on independent non-communist state. Mm-hmm. Was that as codified or was it like we're just going to provide yeah, it? Yeah, so that's why there's this, that, that's why people kind of grasped this document to this report because beforehand it is a little bit more gooey in the language used of what are we trying to do. Um, and uh, you use a good word there, codified, that now they're going to have it actually, this is going to be something that we are def- this is what our goal is. Right, this non-communist, independent, and again, the language in here says stable uh, uh, South Vietnam. So there, this is, I would argue, there is a change happening at this point. And you could say an architect is the Secretary of Defense, uh, McNamara, who we discussed last time. Um, also in the language here, by the way, that McNamara has in this report, is he talks about a graduated military response, gradualism. All right. And this goes with their overall the ideas of the Cold War and how they're going to contain communism using the ideas of flexible response that we read about in Schleit's work. Okay? Uh, and then this gives you an, uh, uh, you know, an idea of this graduated response. This is all personnel um, uh, in this conflict. And obviously we have already looked at that period of advisory mission. Look at the advisors. The number's going up from 61 through 64, in this case 62. So we already have an increase in the advisory role. And so not only are we talking about ground forces, but within those numbers, we see the graduated response and uh, support by air forces. So this matches their doctrine, um, the graduated response. Again, some more context what I've already alluded to is what's affecting Johnson and his decision. Why does he uh, agree with Uh, McNamara's uh, advice, because we cannot forget that the Vietnam War, this conflict so far, is housed in this overall Cold War. All right. There's a memory, and and, uh, it's interesting what party Johnson is part of, right, the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is still still reeling a little bit, uh, bristling at the idea that when Mao Zedong wins the... uh, uh, civil war in China, that the Democratic Party gets blamed for the loss of China. That we saw what happened in the Korean War. This Korean War, this Korean conflict will definitely be on uh, Johnson's mind because the thought is uh, we don't want to get in that situation again. And remember when we talked about the Korean War, specifically the advance beyond the 38 up to the Chinese border to the Jialu River, and what was the response from the Chinese? So the Americans are thinking about the Korean War, especially Johnson. Uh, the idea that maybe the uh, Chinese can get involved. And, and then uh, when we had our lesson on Cold War and SAC, we discussed the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, this idea that the world was on the brink uh, of exchanging nuclear weapons, of getting in that ultimate conflict. And uh, it scared people, and Johnson's affected by this also, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that gives you an idea of why he wants to try to keep things tempered down. He doesn't want to get a sense of... Um, uh, expanding the war, and we'll see how his operation falls into that constraint. Okay, uh, and then I have all there again from that last lesson, specifically with the air forces, specifically with the United States Air Force. We're going to look at um, what remember, remember what that force structure looked like, and what were what were the people in the Air Force training for uh, at this period of time as we're increasing involvement, specifically the air involvement. 
And then more context. We cannot forget that Johnson has something else on his mind. He wants to advance a progressive uh, policy uh, that he terms a great society, uh, reform movements um, that cost a lot of political clout and, uh, and, and cost a lot of money. So he, this, is, this would be, most historians would argue, this is his real interest. The Vietnam War is important but secondary as long as it doesn't grow into something uglier. Okay, so, all right, so as we get into 1964 and there's a recognition um, that there's going to be more involvement by the United States, there's a discussion of how does the air power play into this uh, and the air campaign. And there's development of air campaigns already going on. And I have a nice picture up here um, of LeMay. Uh, he's going to be the chief of staff of the Air Force through 1964. He'll uh, retired at the beginning of 65, taken over by John McConnell. And if we think about LeMay, LeMay, all the stuff we've discussed about him already, he's got that doctrine in mind, that sack dominated bombing doctrine. Um, they've already got an idea of 94 different target sets. Uh, so he's already got a plan of targets. He's got a plan of how long that duration would happen to uh, destroy North Vietnam. But that's not really in Johnson's plan. So this is more of what Johnson's plan is if you do have a, an air campaign. This is what's discussed among, among the advisors. What do we need to do? What would a strategic air campaign do? Well, first and foremost, we have this problem with this insurgency in the South. We have to find ways to stop it. And one thing we have to do is stop the North Vietnamese support of that insurgency in the South. So we could use bombs, power, to kind of send a message um, to... Uh, to, make, to persuade uh, North Vietnam to stop supporting the insurgency in the South. We want the status quo on North and South Vietnam. Uh, then that air power campaign could show to South Vietnam, and I, I put in here, and North Vietnam, and even to our allies, look at U.S. resolve when we're in, in conflict in this Cold War environment. This is our resolve against communism. Uh, then the more practical ideas are, Hey, we need to do some kind of system, uh, strategic destruction of North Vietnamese ability to make war. And as we got in the text, where are all the material? Where's all the material really coming from for them to make this war? Is it North Vietnamese industry or not? All right. So this is what. But this is the idea. This and and not only a strategic to go after the transportation system, industrial base, but also to prevent that stuff from moving around. So that becomes that transportation line. That's the reason for it is um, even if stuff is coming from the outside to help prevent that from keeping North Vietnam sustained, make them feel the pain of war. Uh, likewise, let's do an interdiction, an operational interdiction campaign that prevents that material from going from the north down to the south and primarily through Laos. Right. So but so you got to stop that movement. So that's the development that's happening in 1964 if we do uh, a strategic air campaign. Uh, then there's another incident. There's a lot of small attacks. Things are still happening. The insurgency is still happening in the south. And then we get a situation in the Gulf of Tonkin, um, right off the shores of uh, North Vietnam, where patrol boats attack uh, intelligence gathering ships there. And I'm not concerned about who's provoking what. I don't want to get in that discussion. Um, certainly, here's some nice pictures of the Maddox itself. Here's some pictures of the Vietnamese patrol boats that are coming off the coast uh, that do the attack. There's cries that there's two separate attacks. Uh, we now have the information that says, yep, there was an attack, a first attack. And that was seen as a retaliatory attack, not an aggressive attack by the North Vietnamese. But that second attack that supposedly happened on the 4th didn't happen. But that was some good information. This is what they use. Um, what we like about this, besides the fact that this will lead the president to go to Congress and go, I need more power to fight this thing, what he does from this attack is he retaliates. And he retaliates against the North. So he has a, a small operation coming off the carrier groups uh, uh, off the coast, Operation Pierce Arrow. They hit the patrol boats areas. They hit some supply and ammunition depots uh, down there in the southern panhandle of North Vietnam. So this is a reprisal against the North for the first time. Uh, this is an interest to me. Uh, when I was in your seats, this is where we lose our first pilot. 
Lieutenant Junior Grade Everett Alvarez. He'll be a POW from 64 until 73, nine years. Uh, writes a great biography, came out in the 80s, Chained Eagle. For those of you who've been through East Set, this is something for you to pay attention to. It taught me I don't want to be a POW, right? So, uh, so this is an attack, a, 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 a form, it's a reprisal though, right? It's just a tit for that. That's when, what's been going on. And again, looking at what that air campaign, now there's, it's really starting to gin up that air campaign, and we have the two different thoughts. We have LeMay, who says, hey, I've got 94 targets. I've got 82 stationary targets, railroad targets that are moving around. Give me about 16 days, and I can use my big bombers to go north and destroy this. Uh, so this is uh, some of the advice that's coming out. Those targets have been through Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA. Uh, these have been confirmed targets that, yeah, this could have some effect for, uh, to make North Vietnam maybe react uh, to what we're doing. But the idea here is, well, we don't want to do anything too crazy in this Cold War environment to get the, our enemy responding how we don't want them to respond, i.e. the Chinese and the Soviets. And so instead... This is where we get this idea of gradualism. Hey, let's just keep ratcheting up the power, and this is what the air plan should do, is ratchet, ratchet up that power. So, before we get into rolling thunder, I just want to remind us about the air wars. Last time we discussed the difficulty in the chain of command and the command and control structure of all the different air wars that we saw going on. Um, and in this case, where the bombing's happening. And so when we talk about rolling thunder, we're, we're, we're having about three quarters of a million, 850,000 tons of bombs. There'll be another attack, that's what we talk about next time, uh, another strategic attack in the north uh, in 1972, which will drop more bombs, but that's, that's some pretty good tonnage dropped on North Vietnam. But there's other air wars going along, and I just want to make sure we don't, we don't keep uh, forgetting these. Uh, late, certainly during the same period, we're going to have bombing in Laos, specifically in that Ho Chi Minh Trail region. And then later in the war, an air war against Cambodia, there's some more tonnage of bombs. And South Vietnam proper. I mean, our ally, the one we're supposedly supposed to sustain, that's where most of our air power um, is really going. And, and that is also, think about it, B, big B-52s loaded doing arc-like missions, doing close air support type missions um, down in the south. Uh, so there's the bombing tonnage that all the air wars are going to do, and this is in comparison. Uh, give us some idea of the effort being made in this conflict. Long war, long campaign. So the final thing, there's, uh, again, a number of attacks. You know, there's a, 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 a major attack um, on the air base at Benoit. Uh, where the sappers go in, uh, kill Americans, injure a lot of other Americans. This happens three days before the 1964 campaign. Again, there's always talk about tit for tat. How do we stop the support of this insurgency down in the south? Uh, and then in February 65, um, there's attacks on bases around Pleiku, in the, in, uh, pretty much in the middle of South Vietnam. And uh, this attack of 7 February is kind of the last straw for the Johnson administration. The idea that we're, we're not going to do tit for tat. We've got we've to uh, start to initiate something specific. Uh, if you saw in my uh, outline, there is from this a, a, a tit for tat. They do an operation right after 7 February, uh, again, going against North Vietnam, the southern pro uh, provinces of North Vietnam with a strategic campaign, Operation Flaming Dart. But there was a recognition that there's got to be something more sustained. And within days, there's this idea that we're going to do this thing, rolling thunder. Think about that, rolling, some kind of graduated rolling along, getting bigger maybe, a snowball effect if we have to. Uh, but rolling thunder will be our, our main campaign, and we'll initiate it by the end of February. Um, but that's going to, uh, it's going to be delayed for about a week. So as we get into this Operation Rolling Thunder, I just want to make sure we look at the inventory. We'll talk about this some more, but the inventory that's used, uh, what the aircraft look like, the 100 series, right? We have the F-100 uh, up there in the upper left. The F-105 being dragged along with refueling capabilities. We'll see why the refueler becomes so significant to this operation. The F-4 is definitely involved in this, not only as an air superiority fighter, but as a bomb dropper to air ground. Um, dropping almost as much as the F-105, but definitely I gave you two pictures of F-105 because F-105, the Thunder Chief, 
This is the main airframe I think about uh, uh, with this aircraft. And most importantly, right there in the middle, something that we haven't discussed um, significantly is the role of reconnaissance. All right, uh, reconnaissance aircraft, getting the information to say, uh, how do we measure and how are we going to do this? We're going to do it through, um, uh, through our recon and make sure that we pick the targets right and now have we hit the targets um, and what kind of effects those are going to have. So, Rolling Thunder. It's fought within the Cold War context. It sees a heavy-handed, now you're going to go, wait a second, heavy-handed civilian control. And you'll see what I mean by this. Obviously, we're, we understand uh, the system that we have in the United States of civilian control of the military. In this case, maybe a heavy-handed approach by the civilian control um, to try to support that war on the ground as well as to coerce the enemy to apply... Uh, uh, to comply with our objectives of having a stable, independent, non-communist South Vietnam. And we have to remember that the tool is going to be a SAC-dominated Air Force that's really ready for World War III. And yet, uh, the goodness that Thompson discusses in his book with, in, re, in regard to rolling thunder operation is the adaptation that's being done. Now, that's a lot, a lot to hang your hat on, all right? We don't accomplish the objectives. Uh, it, it doesn't win the war. It doesn't coerce North Vietnam. Um, however, uh, there's some goodness. Maybe. Okay. This gives us an idea of how uh, the, the president saw air power as a tool. In Earl Tur uh, Tilford's work on this, hey, on one hand, our planes and bombs could be used as carrots for the South pushing them to clean up their corrupt house. On the other hand, it sticks against the north. Uh, and he notes, usually when you do carrots and sticks, it's to the same focus, same individual. Uh, but he, also, he talked about that too, awesome. Uh, Rolling Thunder will have a carrot and stick approach to it, specifically towards the North Vietnamese. All right, so Rolling Thunder has its first uh, campaign uh, beginning the uh, 2nd of March, 1965. And initially, to show this gradualism and to show the context that the, uh, the war is being fought in, the idea is to go in the lower region of the panhandle of North Vietnam. Okay, so if the 17th parallel is where North and South is dividing, initially all the bombing campaign went after what they saw as strategic targets just south of the 19th parallel. And so we're talking going after ammunition zones, supply depots, uh, in this case, radar sites. In modern day, because think about it, this is what LeMay is talking about that too. In modern day, what normally do we like to gain first as far as an air campaign goes? Superiority. Air superiority. So what would be one of the targets that we would love to go after? Air bases. Air bases are kind of off the limits. Okay, so this is being done a little bit differently. It's your strategic campaign, yet it's kind of going against... Uh, the normal military thinking, okay? Um, it's mainly an interdiction campaign. Again, I would say even to the north, it's an interdiction campaign of ma material moving around to sustain North Vietnam. It's trying to send a message to them. Likewise, it's an interdiction campaign at the operational level to stop those supplies from going south. Nick. So are we using the F-111 MISTIs at this point as forward air controllers? Uh, well, F-100s F as forward air, they're using it as MISTIs. Um, F-111 will come in later. Uh, in the Rolling Thunder campaign, not too much uh, effect. That's why I don't have pictures of them. They'll, they'll have a little bit more effect in the next reading when we talk about linebacker. Anna? Sir, where did these restrictions come from? Uh, they're, they're coming from higher up. So we'll see. Uh, I, I kind of have some nice little maps, you know me and maps. Um, these are restrictions that are self-imposed by the administration onto the air power um, leaders, okay, to prevent... Uh, so restrictions, rules of engagement, measuring success, these are all difficulties that we read about in, um, in Thompson's two chapters. So on those restrictions. Again, most of the stuff is below the 19th parallel, and later, soon after, in 1965, as they're rolling this along, they'll move it to about the 20th parallel line. And the restrictions are, well, we can't do anything that might upset the other enemies the other monolithic 
uh, elements of communism, the Soviets or the Chinese, who we know are supporting the North Vietnamese. So we're not going to bomb along a 25 or 30 mile, matters where you're at, along the border with China. Because, hey, last time we had soldiers on the border with China, they came across in hordes. Right? So the idea that you're not going to hit along the border. Likewise, the major cities of Haifong, uh, Hanoi and the port of Haiphong, we're going to have uh, a restricted zone, a prohibitive zone uh, of, of attacking. And that every target is going to be chosen by the president. All right? He's going to approve every target. We'll, we'll talk about that. So these are the three major restrictions besides normal R, 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 ROE. And if, for example, in the, in the text, I, being the transporter that I am, the ROE of the F-105 pilot who comes over target and then after target sees a C-1, uh, uh, a cargo plane um, with a star on it, recognizes it's a North Vietnamese cargo plane, target of opportunity, shoots it down. And that's beyond the rules of engagement, right? So uh, very restricted um, use of air power. So those are the restrictions. So those are the three main restrictions that we're talking, and that's to try to not escalate this conflict. And that target picking initially starts off by uh, Johnson meeting with a small group of advisors. Specifically, uh, in 1965, early 1965, he'll start meeting with uh, Robert McNamara uh, during lunch uh, and also the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. Uh, McNamara will have a list. This list of targets has been moved up um, from uh, first, second air division that's run in the show, later 13th Air Force, uh, or 7th Air Force, so we always hear about 7th Air Force. Uh, that's going to go through um, the Sink Pack, Sharp, down at, uh, in, in Honolulu. It's going to move up to the Pentagon. It's going to move over to state. It's going to kind of go back to the JCS, and that's going to be in McNamara's hands. And now they're going to take this list of, this is what we want to do, this is why we want to do these targets, and now they're going to have a discussion among the three of them. And pretty soon that discussion starts expanding. Uh, initially at those discussions, what's missing? Any kind of military advisor. This picture is from a later period of time where General Wheeler is actually sitting um, uh, on it, and he's invited later. This is probably from 67 uh, as we get into 68. Okay? All right. Where are these uh, attacks coming from? Um, well, it's a combined effort. It is a joint effort, but it's not a, really a joint event. Uh, we have Yankee Station, the carrier group, sitting right off the coast uh, of Da Nang. Uh, that's uh, usually got three carriers there that are doing, they're the ones who did uh, the reprisal of Pierced Arrow. Um, they're they're the, the Navy portion of it, and uh, also um, bases in Thailand. So we've got Tak Lee, Udorn. Uh, Nakhon Phnom, NKP, as, the, as Thompson discusses it, NKP, Uban, and Karat. So those are the main areas where the uh, fighters and the tankers um, are coming out of, and along with some air coming out of Da Nang. So that's where these guys are coming um, into the north. I say it's a kind of, it's not really a joint, you know, it's joint, right? You've got the Navy doing attacks, you've got the Air Force doing attacks, but how they break it up is, is, again, part of this command and control structure that's kind of odd, uh, one that uh, we're not familiar with today. Uh, so last time you kind of saw it broken up in divisions, so the very busy slide, but right down, here is my, oh, right down here is my 17th parallel, and there's seven route package areas. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, and two big significance ones would be 6A, 6B, which have the major industrial areas of North Vietnam. And these areas are parceled out. Okay, so the Air Force and, and some uh, the, the South Vietnamese Air Force also will get this route air. All their uh, routes are going into one. The Navy gets two, three, four, and 6B. And the Air Force also gets 5 and 6A. So I thought that was a great example. Later in the war, when finally there's a recognition of this graduated response, uh, and there's an idea of, hey, now we're going to allow attack on airfields. There is this uh, effort to go after the MiGs, who have been having great success about, uh, against U.S. formations. Um, we're going to go after um, Fukien Airfield outside of Hanoi. 
And the Navy wanted a part of that, and it took a lot of extra coordination um, to break down the barriers and allow deconfliction. All right, so other than that, you were kind of kept to your place. This also shows uh, refueling tracks. It also shows something very significant, and, you, and I thought the reading did a good job of incorporating search and rescue, okay, all the search and rescue issues. Um, this, uh, you know, some couple good pictures here. There was a package going in that's EB-66, so this has got to be pretty early in the war, that EB-66 is, is jamming any kind of radars. It's doing some jamming, bringing in, escorting the F-105 bombers in. And there's uh, General uh, Momire, a 7th Air Force commander, uh, the intellectual Air Force commander, right? So uh, uh, he'll end up penning a book five years after the conflict. I think he came out in 78, Air Power in Three Wars, uh, which is a good book for us to reflect on. So once again, we have a SAC-dominated uh, Air Force structure. And this would be the aircraft that you think might be carrying out these missions in total. And as Thompson informs us, this would have been too much of a, um, of a show of force as far as Johnson was concerned. He would not let the B-52s go up north. All right? So in Rolling Thunder, the B-52s won't see action up in that northern part of Vietnam. It'll take another strategic campaign bef before we see that happen. But these are involved in missions down in the south trying to stop that as air, air interdiction platforms. So not doing their strategic bombardment, bombardment effort, but an air interdiction um, effort. Instead, the primary uh, platform will be those 100 series fighters. Um, F-105, F-100. What were these designed to do? Well, like we discussed after Korea, it was designed to um, participate as TAC wanted to participate in that big war with the Soviet Union, the dra dropping of tactical nukes. So you look at swept wing, big engines, moving fast. These aren't air-to-air -air fighters. These are, have one idea, and that is to get as deep as you can, drop your nuke, and then try to get back as far as you can. Um, one aspect of these is how effective are they at bombing. Uh, did Thompson give us a discussion of this? about the, uh, the ability? I don't remember if it exactly did, but F-105 is being designed as low altitude, high speed tactical nuke chuckers were not very good at bombing traditionally. So yeah, so that conventional uh, dispersion of your uh, conventional arms, very difficult. Uh, so this gives us an idea of adaptation. They're using this plan that's designed to do something else to be involved in this air war. Uh, and initially, these pilots haven't been trained that effectively on dropping conventional munitions. And so they talk about a circular error of po probability of 750 feet. That means with a radius of 750 feet, 50% 50 of the bombs dropped are in that, rate, in, in that, um, in, in that area, only 50%. Th that doesn't tell us where else everything's going. And when you're talking about trying to be precise and hitting proper targets and avoiding conflict with uh, other enemies at some of these places, uh, this gives you an idea um, of how things might not be so effective. Later in the conflict, uh, with more training, more experience, you know, tell me if you think this is good, you engineers out there, right? It gets down to about 350 circular area of probability. And, and, and it's just because the force is not designed um, uh, to do this. But, um, John, I got that up for you, 135's Dragon. When you take off, you hit the refueler, you go over target. When you come off, you have to hit the refueler and get back to base in Thailand. So uh, incredible coordination in, uh, with that also. So uh, there's your fleet, not really designed. Uh, the Navy's got similar problems, but they do have, as Thompson reminds us, the best fighter for this capability, the A6. Uh, it's got radar jamming capabilities. It drops... Uh, and he goes ad nauseum later uh, talking about the, the walleye um, munition, the idea that this is guided, it's not, has no propellant, but it's a guided munition, um, and it's an all-weather, and this becomes a problem, right? Uh, the weather capability of not only can you hit those targets, have you been cleared to hit those targets, now can you actually see those targets? And are there any secondary targets? Again, uh, graduate response, initially... 
uh, Johnson really keeps a control on stuff. He doesn't want anything to get out of control. So if you can't hit the primary target, you go home. Um, later, hey, there are some secondary targets that you can hit. And those are the aircraft that are doing it. Um, and then I, I don't want to disregard this, and I think uh, Thompson does a good job for us, uh, talking about giving us those stories uh, of the situation of pilots who are able uh, to get rescued. Here's a package, what a package would look like um, going in with the A1s and helicopters to get those guys that are shot down. So why, why else is this so significant? Because the Americans are going against, at the time, one of the strongest integrated air defense systems established, established by the Soviet Union. And established and trained, one reason why you're not going after airfields is you've got advisors, Soviet advisors, Chinese advisors at all these airfields. And the North Korean fighter pilots uh, have incredible success, right? So compared to um, some previous, uh, uh, our previous discussion in Korea, and so they're flying some pretty good aircraft, MiG-17 up there to the left, uh, and then the MiG-21 in small numbers, but uh, the MiG-21 will come in. And, and these are very capable fighters and very capable pilots uh, that, uh, that have vision in the north. They've got radar vision, um, and so they know where things are coming and going, unlike the American pilots. And this is one aspect that's going to determine how you're going to uh, ingress and egress your target. Um, is knowing that any time these guys uh, can jump on you. Which is why when you go in with a bombing package like the F-105s, like this upper right-hand picture shows you, you also are going in with uh, escort, uh, air-to-air air -air escort, uh, primarily in the F-4. Okay? So, so that's one element of this integrated air defense system. And, and, and um, the other element that's probably most successful in the war, now this shows... Uh, anti-aircraft artillery primarily, some larger caliber, maybe you might consider this small arms in a sense, but certainly throwing lead up in the air, right, all the way down to the soldiers who are trained very well that when they hear something to just point the, uh, try to go for that golden BB, right. Um, so this, and, and a lot of these uh, anti-aircraft artillery, a lot of the larger calibers are radar guided, for example. So we're talking a very uh, sophisticated um, small arms and anti-aircraft artillery, which is another issue. So you have the fighters flying around, and now this is the reason why you don't want to come in too low. You come in too low, and these are the guys that are going to get you. But then, more scarier for the pilots is you can't go too high either because you have uh, surface-to-air missiles, primarily in the SA-2 guideline. Um, so these would start off having radar on, radar uh, capturing you, shooting off this telephone pole, and that thing would come out and do a proximity fuse and destroy your aircraft. Here's a picture of an F-105 right before it gets hit. And trying to find these fields, uh, the Soviets were very good at advising the North Vietnamese to move these around and continue to uh, make mobile sites uh, that integrate the radar with it. Um, so that shows you this integrated air defense system in this small region that you're trying to ingress in a, and out of um, with your fast fighter bombers. And so some ad adaptation takes place. Uh, this is the one that uh, I'm, so, I'm most amazed about. When there was a recognition that these radars are turning on, that we need to go after the SAM sites, it's decided, what if we use a two-seater F-100? We put a pilot in the back seat. Uh, that pilot can kind of do radar signatures. We can go right down after these sites and drop bombs on them, either on the radar or on the SAM sites himself. Um, there's a great interview out there with one of the guys that first participated in this, and thus, thus for the uh, patch, the wild weasels, a mission that we still have. And when he was asked and told, this is what you're going to do, he said, you've got to be shitting me. All right, so the, 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 this shows you the involvement of, of this mission. Um, uh, we have on here, uh, I've got a picture, there's Major Thorson. These are two guys doing Wild Weasels, uh, Medal of Honor winner uh, on this mission. Um, that Their role is to go in, escort another strike package, make sure it, it either uh, jams or can take out a uh, SAM site and uh, pave the path for the other guys. Another example that's very um, uh, famous, it, it was effective one significant time but uh, done by a former commandant. After this, uh, after this job, he'll become the commandant cadets here. 
uh, 67. This is Robin Oles, the wing commander of 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at Adorn, and uh, his vice wing commander, General Chappie James. Um, they decide every time we send these strike packages in at the same time, the strike packages go the same route. Uh, they look the same, and all the initiative is for the communists. Uh, and then they know when an F-105 package is coming in, and they'll come up and, and, uh, and jump them. So in this case, they recognized that they were having a hard time getting air superiority, and this was a, a role that they were going to do. They were going to take F-4s armed with uh, AIM-7 and AIM-9s, uh, one a radar guider, radar, the other one a heat seeker, uh, and we're going to go in, flying the same route the F-105s normally do, talk like the F-105s talk, fly the formation so our radar signature looks just like the F-105s, and it's incredibly effective. As they come over the target, um, the North, North Vietnamese take the bait, and they jump up in the air with their MiG-21s. I think there were 16 in their inventory at the time. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but these 16 have been very effective. And when they come up, instead of seeing F-105s that are heavily laden with bombs, they're not very maneuverable, they instead see the F-4. And the F-4s will take down seven of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, um, the MiGs that come up in the air. I know there's a report out there about nine, too, but seven is the one that I normally see. So the F-4 doesn't have guns on it. It's the first missile-only aircraft. Yeah, it's missile-only. It right. will later get a gun pod okay. put on it. How right? did the pilots feel about that at first? Do you know, sir? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I don't really know how they felt about it not having guns. Obviously, they're used to this environment. This flying in this environment, thinking that they, we were going to go air-to-air, far-off engagements with a Soviet force, it makes sense. Now you're in this situation. You get, you've get these World War II, uh, uh, Korea War experienced pilots who go, we need to look more like uh, engaging uh, air superiority like we're used to. And then you get the gun pod. And then you get designs that say, we're going to go back to the gun. And we're, and we're going to start training again. That, by the way, that's something that comes out of this. Okay, So these are two examples of... Uh, of just adapting, you know, I've already said three, right? You've got to take this airframe and try to adapt it to the situation, uh, these packages. Um, and then these are two specific examples of, of how they're trying to do their best to get bombs on target uh, to have effect. But already, you know, um, one of the issues with the campaign is it's a, a carrot stick. And the idea of how do we get the North Vietnamese, how do we co coerce them? And so one idea is that you bomb them, and then we do a pause. And we say, hey, we need to have a powwow. Let's negotiate. Let's talk about this. Um, and so this becomes a back and forth. There's uh, a number of bomb, you know, eight major bombing pauses. In 1965, they start this in March. There's already a discussion of a bombing pause in May. Uh, at the end of 65, there will be a, a over a month-long bombing pause to try to... Um, uh, talk with the, uh, try to get the North Vietnamese to, uh, to coerce them to stop supporting the South Vietnamese insurgency. And the main architect of all of this, even within five months of this campaign beginning, um, certainly by 1966, he doesn't think that this campaign is working. And he'll become an outlier. He'll start saying, maybe we should just stop this campaign and focus on what's happening in the South. Um, Johnson keeps him on for well over a year. He's McNamara will not, you know, whether you say he voluntarily leaves or he's let loose by the president, which is the more uh, typical situation, that doesn't happen until 1968, the beginning, of, uh, right in the middle of the Tet Offensive, February 68. So here's an idea that says um, maybe this is not working. Uh, and then we get the, uh, the ultimate, you know, the, the idea that in 1966 we're seeing results, 1967. Uh, maybe this is working. The military is very optimistic about this campaign uh, and how it's working. Uh, and then you have in January of 1968 a major uh, attack along all of South Vietnam. This is mainly led by uh, the NLF, the Viet Cong that are in the South, certainly supported and supplied by North Vietnam, and there are regular North Vietnamese troops here. This demonstrates that the, even the operational level of infiltration hasn't worked. And certainly, you haven't enticed North Vietnam in any way to stop what they're doing. So the Tet Offensive is kind of a, 
uh, you know, it's a major issue for the entire war, war but it's certainly a turning point for the air campaign in the North. Uh, so much so that this long campaign is going to slowly but surely come for a close. Okay? Uh, it's a 40 month, 44 month on and off, like I said, eight bombing pauses, all the pauses that you have for weather, um, but you still fly 300,000 sorties. You lose 922 aircraft just in the, that campaign up in the north and the POWs that come with that, uh, which we'll, we'll spend more time discussing in the next lesson. When Trent and I went to the Command and Staff College, they made a big point about the operational metrics being a large reason for the failure of Rolling Thunder. Would you agree with that? Like measuring it by bombs dropped or sortie rates? Exactly. I mean, that's not telling you of effects, right? Exactly. And this will be something that comes out, right? right? The, the, the Air Force uh, starts really kind of going in like, who cares how much we do? What effect does it have in the end? Um, and so that becomes an issue, right? That, oh, yeah, we flew this many things. We dropped this many bombs. Uh, it's a number that you can put your arms around. Um, but is it telling you anything? Uh, when you're damaging stuff, uh, you know, the transportation lines, you go after bridges. Okay, you damage a bridge. Well, how fast do they repair it? Or how do they not even need it? How do they find other ways across the river besides this major uh, bridge that was built during the French colonial period? Um, okay, so you're right. Um, this becomes an issue with gradualism as a whole, not only what you're doing in the air campaign, but what you're doing in the South. How do you measure this that you're having some kind of effect? Uh, so I, as I mentioned, Tet has a major effect. Uh, the president has approval rating drop. The support for the war is, uh, it has been uh, in a downward spiral in 67, and now there's a, an idea that, man, there's not much support, not even support now for bombing the North. And Johnson will, um, in March of 68, uh, say, hey, I'm not going to run for president. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to concentrate on the Vietnam War and I'm looking to stop this bombing campaign against the North. Um, and once there's, again, uh, some dancing around the issues of trying to get the North Vietnamese to agree to s negotiation, finally when there's a sense of that happening, uh, it, it halts um, in, uh, uh, in November of 1968. And the big thing, it's a failure. It failed to halt the interdiction down to the South, the support to the South, or the ability for North Vietnam to continue. Um, and, and we could look at that to say, well, it's not a normal strategic uh, bombing campaign. Who's supporting North Vietnam? Where are they getting um, all of their stuff? And so towards the end of the conflict, we are using B-52s. We're using all of this firepower. Like you said, is it having an effect? And what does this guy really need to carry out the conflict? What does this guy need to move the stuff down the south? I'm using a bicycle. All right, I've got my bag of rice for food and sustenance. I'm taking down a few bombs. And so how effective and how difficult is it to stop that? So it, it gives us a sense. So significance of this. Besides, again, we're not done talking about air power in Vietnam. Uh, we'll talk about linebacker missions next time, another strategic bombing campaign that's four years after the end of this uh, strategic campaign. But uh, this quote in uh, uh, Mo Meyer's uh, uh, Air Power in Three Wars that I mentioned earlier, this is why you're here, right? You're here, develop your officership, character as an officer, speaking of reporting correctly, doing the right thing, right? But even more, you are the architects. You're the people that are supposed to understand. And I know you guys are going to be great at understanding tactical level of air power, but the, you know, can you have a better understanding uh, of how it fits in the bigger picture, and can you articulate it to your civilian overseers, right? So I think that's a pretty nice quote. So are there any questions for dismissal? Kevin. Uh, sir, I got one. So just when I was going through the reading, a bit that stood out to me was when the author told an anecdote about President Johnson that says that about a year before Rolling Thunder ended, so it says that, at a meeting with his closest advisors on August 18, 1967, Johnson complained that the United States could not win without parades, songs, and bond drives. And so Johnson's known for being rather colorful behind closed doors in his meetings, but I don't know, sir, it seems like he's trying to just throw some shade on the ability of the United States at this time to win a limited war. And so my question is, like, what context do you think that image of the image of bonds, war drives, or just parades, like, 
Do you think we've come to be able to fight limited wars better? Boy, that's on a greater... I mean, uh, we, we, Another reason, the uh, significance of this lesson is we find ourselves, how do we apply air power in this current uh, environment? Uh, and, 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 and what effects uh, can you have with air power? And even more important, what I think he's getting at in 1967 is, in his idea of gradualism, this air campaign of rolling sun, uh, thunder seemed like a, a nice panacea. Like, I don't have to cross the border uh, the 17th parallel and invade. Instead, I can send my message using air power. And so this guy has an idea uh, of what, uh, an idea that we would now deem maybe incorrect of what air power can do. Um, and so that's, I think, more significant of that quote is uh, this is his frustration to think I've got this, I'm, I'm a massive country, I've got this massive tool, and why is this not working? All right, so you want to put it on a, uh, a bigger idea, this is something we have to grapple with. Uh, can air power alone? No. But can air power influence? Sure. Okay. Yep. Sir, you mentioned previously in the, in the slides, um, you talked briefly on President Johnson's Great Society and then also balanced that against the Vietnam War. Would you say that trying to do both doomed both? So, uh, certainly that's a, a take from uh, many historians, right, trying to balance these two things. Um, and, of course, as I was trying to allude to, the idea that his domestic agenda, um, his, his previous role as a senator now, and a vice president, now as a president, his domestic agenda definitely was on the high list of his attention. Um, and that in trying to do both, well, you know, um, he did it. He tried to do it on the cheap in the sense that... Uh, he didn't want to, in the military, call up the reserves. Uh, he didn't want to, uh, uh, if he's going to do all the spending, he wanted to do it through deficit spending, not through uh, increased taxation. So there is, an, you know, there is a lot of discussion in there that this was a lot to try to put onto the country uh, at one time. And um, in, a, uh, in a book, in another class that we're reading, that's that historian's take is, in an attempt to try to do both, failed at both. So... Any other questions? Okay, next reading. Again, we're going to be uh, two chapters out of this talking about linebacker. Let's go ahead and bring with us uh, what we're coming out of this uh, discussion with and bring it to our linebacker discussion. And this will be the ultimate question because this is what Thompson is alluding to. Uh, and it's a, it, it's, a, it's a point of view that is pretty heavily out there. And that is, if we only used air power in 1965 like we used it in 1972, we would add a change, and you need to see how Thompson deals with this, uh, and that, that'll be the point of our discussion next time. Appreciate your guys' attention, and looking forward to see you uh, next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.